First of all, thank you to the association for inviting me and for all of you to uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. And um, it's great. I, I, it's, it's interesting that I just realized that actually I've never been on a panel with Akar before. As far as I can remember, although we've been working together in Amnesty for some years now. So it's a, it's a funny coincidence that after so many years, we're getting a chance to be together on a panel. Um, so I, I thought that, you know, one way of beginning this conversation is just to, I mean, obviously the audience today is made up of informed, uh, it's a very informed audience, but when I speak to people who are kind of just lay persons who don't sit and think about these issues all the time, when I talk about democracy in India, I, I always start by saying, okay, let's think of what does a democracy mean for you know so, who's somebody who's not a political scientist or an academic on the subject? So obviously, I think the first thing that comes to mind is it's in a contrast to dictatorship. I think that's a kind of good starting point, which means that power is to the people. It's not with a privileged few. Um, that it's a government by for of the people, which means there's a lot of accountability to the people. And individual and collective freedoms are very, very important. It's kind of the core of democracy and, and minority rights, which uh, Shireen touched on. And of course, respect for constitution and rule of law. So I would say, you know, these are some of the obvious things which we think of when we say democracy. Now, there is no question whatsoever that, uh, you know, this regime has kind of taken the process of dismantling democracy to an industrial scale in the last seven years. And I'll just give you some of the reasons why I think that has happened. So, so let's take this first one. So, you know, is it a government of the people? You know, is it something which is power has gone to the people? I think far from it. Shireen has already explained the caste system. I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with it. At last count, uh, I think a third of the cabinet ministers are Brahmins. There are only uh, two women. Uh, out of the 89 top civil servants, there's only one Dalit, no Lokas. And you're all aware that there's not a single elected Muslim MP in the current Lok Sabha, which is our uh, most powerful house of parliament. Uh, and it's common knowledge that this government is kind of bankrolled by some very heavy hitting, uh, very, very rich uh, corporate Ambani and Adani are the two which constantly come up. But there's a whole bunch of them. Those two are the better known ones in the Indian context, billionaires, the top billionaires. So that's that's who this government represents, you know, and whatever their rhetoric is, the fact is that it's an upper caste, upper class, you know, very, very uh, elite regime. Um, the decision making, talking about decision making is controlled pretty much with, you know, what we call prime minister and his plus one, who is the home minister. Uh, they call Shah and Shahan Shah. And, um, yeah, and it's essentially a sort of a monarchy or a dictatorship form of regime in the sense that even the cabinet ministers cannot really speak up. I think pretty much all, anybody who wants to speak, even the cabinet is seek permission from the prime minister's office, which is made up of a group of very select bureaucrats, mostly from the Gujarat cadre who our prime minister trusts. And all of this is relevant for what I'm going to be saying later, because, you know, I just give you some characteristics of the, of the regime and why it's anything but democratic. The other thing, of course, is the accountability mechanism. So, you know, obviously you need checks and balances in a democracy. The parliament itself is massively run by this uh, ruling party and its allies. So they have a brute majority. So any bill they want to pass just kind of sails through. There's really no discussion. Uh, things are passed in the middle of the night. All the parliamentary standing committees, etc., have been pretty much defanged. And all of the other checks and balances, the media, the traditional media and the social media, uh, you know, this joke that Facebook and Instagram has run from the prime minister's office. The judiciary has been silenced to a considerable extent, particularly at the Supreme Court level. Uh, major uh, laws which we had, like the right to information, I think Akash said he's going to talk more about the law, so I won't go into that. But several such laws have been, which are very powerful laws for information transparency, have been pretty much diluted. A civil society has been crushed, as uh, most of you know. Uh, at least the ones who are critical and, you know, uh, questioning of the regime and freedoms when it comes to freedoms um, is there a frontal attack on freedom of expression association assembly all the religion all the most of movement you know all of those are at risk are dissenters uh, whether from the media from the legal fraternity from activists um, are either in jail or they're in, undergoing investigations of some sort or the other so there's huge intimidation of fierce psychosis 
even the most prominent opposition leaders are permanently under you know severe pressure and as you know our politicians in, in many case have enough uh, you know ghosts in the closet so uh, and these people have really used the fact that we don't have very clean politicians in the opposition to full advantage so and finally on the minority rights and, and the constitutional side of things um, and uh, Shireen, you mentioned the Dalit question. I think, again, going by official government records, which increasingly one can't rely on anymore because they're stopping publishing uh, many of the kinds of things which were regularly published on human rights, on atrocities, on even on the economy, we can't trust the figures anymore. But by going by official records, uh, in a five-year period since this regime took over power, the atrocities against Dalits have increased eight times. Uh, on the Adivasi issue or the indigenous tribal question, a lot of their rights have been have been under attack, including by you know by breaching the Forest Rights Act, which is anything which is providing some safeguards to the most vulnerable people has been under attack. On the Muslim question, I think this audience doesn't need to be told about you know the increase in communal incidents using official records again, the beef lynching deaths, the triple talaq, uh, the mosque being first broken down a long time ago, but now the construction of the temple, um, the CA, of course, that, that's very well known, but a constant sniping on the uniform civil code as well. So, and family planning, you know, constant bringing up the family planning question. So they come at, come at it from different angles. And finally, on the constitution, um, as you know, the article 370 was, you know, it was a direct kind of attack on the constitution, on the whole issue of federalism itself. And the Citizenship Amendment Act essentially is trying to create two classes of citizens. So it's kind of direct attack on the basic structure of the constitution, if you please. So that's on, you know, just, I think most of your people know about this, but I thought let's remind ourselves why we're, why we're talking about reclaiming democracy, because it's, it's not just under attack. I think, you know, it's a very systematic process of dismantling it. And COVID is interesting. And I wanted to touch briefly on the COVID question because uh, you know, we can't not touch on that um, in, in the current situation in India, where those of us who are here, it's just all around us. It's devastating the country. Over a million people are, I mean, most reasonable authorities who are honest would say at least a million people have died, which is a 4x of the official number that's been declared. And potentially, we, I mean, I think safe estimates are 300 million people are infected, which is about 10 times the number which is being officially given by the government. So it's a health crisis, there's untold suffering, a humanitarian crisis, and it is certainly the second wave is a completely man-made uh, crisis. There's no debate about that, no oxygen, no beds, no medicines, and a complete hash of the vaccine situation. And I'm, I'm mentioning all this because this is not unconnected from the democracy question. As you know, the four worst performing countries in the world have regimes which are anti-democratic fundamentally, Trump under, I mean, America under Trump, Bolsonaro's Brazil, uh, Russia's uh, Putin's Russia, uh, and of course India. So there's a direct relationship between the two, and um, and you know the and the underlying issue is that these are governments who are and who are totally believe, who totally believe in centralization and uh, massive pandemic like this requires a lot of local empowerment for decision making. But all decisions are made by a handful of people, and they are fundamentally anti-science. So you know having a centralized government and an anti-science government is the worst thing you can have at this time in uh, history. So I, my line has been that we have two viruses in this country now. One is COVID and the other is the RSS BJP and only one of them has a vaccine. Um, and even that one, we're not getting anyway. So, so let me just uh, close by talking about what I feel is kind of the big picture. You know, what's underlying all of this? Because uh, it, it, this is kind of more descriptive, you know, understanding the problem. But and I think, um, you know, so what, what, is, what is the India situation now? I've been out of the country for about 25 years and then I came back three years ago. So uh, I, when I left the country, India's ranking uh, in the world in terms of what we call the Human Development Index was about 139. When I came back after 25 years, we were 135. So in a space of a quarter of a century, we've gone up on the Human Development Index by about four places. So we're still at the bottom third of the countries in the world. And at the same time, we say we have the fifth highest GDP in the world. We have the fourth largest number of dollar billionaires in the world. You're probably aware that Adani's growth in his wealth base in the last year during COVID was even higher than Jeff Bezos. So nobody has made so much additional 
uh, money in the last one year than uh, than uh, and in contrast to that we we are the 12th most unequal country in the world uh, you know we have some of the worst corruption indices and all the democracy indices we've been coming down year after year whether it's Sweden or the economist ranking the EU ranking all of that I think you are all fully aware of it and it goes back to this question as to whether democracy sits well uh, with this country at all and I think fundamentally democracy is antithetical uh, to India's caste based patriarchal very you know, color and race driven society. It's tinged with racism and deep religious bigotry. So, you know, the principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which, you know, India signed up to, or even what our constitution says, is trying to upend something which has been built over 2000 years or longer than that. So, I mean, we have to be realistic as to what you can do in 70 years. And yes, you know, Mandal uh, Commission and, uh, you know, Ambedkar's constitutional protections that he brought in for the Dalit. So the Dalit backward cast, uh, you know, uh, kind of resurgence of some sort or assertiveness of some sort, which has happened over 70 years, which is still really, you know, just a very kind of, it's not a very deep kind of empowerment, but even that shallow empowerment or you know, limited empowerment is seeing some kind of a backlash. Um, and that's what we have today. We have 70 years later. Uh, you can't really say that we have a democracy. What we do have are elections. And the, and the difficulty with elections without any of the other elements of, uh, you know, of democracy is that effectively in a first past the post system, it essentially leads to majoritarianism. And, and what these people have mastered is since the lower castes are completely divided, otherwise the only way they can consolidate the upper, the, the Hindu, so-called Hindu vote is by attacking Muslims. So, uh, and I think I've talked to some of you before about this, you know, I, I, I tend to agree with the view that the real problem that the BJP RS is kind of the upper caste class groups in the country have, which is mostly male driven as well, is actually that the lower caste are starting to assert themselves. And they have the only way they can get back to their position of power is by, you know, is by doing by attacking, uh, you know, Muslims. And so that leaves us with the last question as to, you know, okay, in a sense, we, we know some of this and, you know, this is a real quandary before us. What are the solutions? And I want to close with that. Um, so I think the, Obvious solution really is what uh, you know Ambedkar and and Kanchi Ram and many others had told us a long time ago. So it's not an original idea, which is a kind of Bahujan idea, which is to bring together the Dalit, the Muslim, the lowest caste, and to understand you know the game that's being played by the by the more privileged uh, groups in the country. And and Muslims in any case are going to find it very difficult to fight this battle. So I would think you know that the the so-called Hindus should be at the front end, the progressive liberal forward thinking Hindus should be fronting this battle um, and the rest, you know, have then I think Muslims often don't quite register the fact that, you know, making an alliance with the Dalit and the backward caste is so central for their future victory. Um, I think also that, you know, so I think the, the solutions are two levels. One is the short term one, which is political. And the second is longer term, which is ideological. So in the short term, as I said, the kind of coming together of the and those who are being oppressed is one thing. And also if we can find a way of getting the opposition parties to work better together, because uh, that's simply a tactical requirement, which is a challenge in India, because it's not like the US where you have just two parties and they coalesce, but uh, you know, they, they, it's clear that all the factions, even if you have a big kind of bun fight within the Democratic Party, in the end, they're fighting the Republicans uh, as one group. You know? uh, whereas here, it's so, I mean, the, the, this kind of divide and rule system, which the BJP RSS use. I would say the third solution in the short term is financing. I think there's a big financing crisis for, uh, and you know, demonetization, all that was par and this constant income tax rates, et cetera, selectively done, has led to a real hollowing out of the resources for the progressive groups. So that's in the short term. In the long term, I think that, you know, there's massive work to be done and maybe showing what you're doing, which is peace, value-based education, and, you know, working with schools, colleges, and the media has to be, you know, brought back. The media has completely been taken over by these people, the mainstream media. So sort of a counter Shaka movement needs to happen at the grassroots level, uh, you know, cultural, political mobilization, particularly of Dalit, OBC. And, um, and uh, I, I'm getting a kind of message saying that I've, I'm in the kind of closing stages, which work, which works well for me, Shireen. Uh, I know that Ambassador Siddiqui wanted me to speak a little about, you know, what could the diaspora in the U.S., 
do about about this but maybe we can come back to this question in the you know discussion because i think i've more or less taken my time there's a lot more one can say but i think this is uh, good enough for me to kind of give my opening thoughts thank you